So our speaker today is Professor Gabrielle Delanoy. Uh, she's a professor at the uh, Catholic University of Leuven, Kau Leuven, in Belgium, in the Department of Earth and Environmental Sciences in the Faculty of Bioscience Engineering. Her research is interested in land surface observation, uh, satellite observation, often um, in modeling and in data assimilation. Uh, with a special focus on soil moisture, groundwater, vegetation, and snow. And I guess you will hear more about that in a moment. Um, Gabrielle received her PhD from Ghent University in Belgium. She did uh, postdoc research on snow data assimilation at the Institute of Global Environment and Society in Maryland, which I think is part of the Goddard Space uh, Center, another institution. And she was also a senior scientist at the NASA Global Modeling and Assimilation Office. And she worked also, for instance, on the SMAP uh, level four um, surface and root zone soil moisture data products and on the data assimilation. She has many publications in highly ranked journals. She won prestigious awards and also she serves as an associate editor and reviewer to, uh, to multiple journeys, journals. And now I give the floor to Gabriel. Thank you, Jürgen, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this lecture. First, I'd like to acknowledge all my team members and collaborators who contributed um, to the research that I'm presenting today. So what will we talk about today? It's going to be about integrating land observations and land surface modeling uh, towards sustainable water management. So first, we'll take a closer look at the land surface and more specifically, to the water in and on the land surface. If there is no water in the soil, uh, then there is no food on the table. If there is too little uh, water in the soil, you could also have wildfires. If there is too much water in the soil, you get other hazards like landslides or floods. And then you have water in, for example, peatlands, uh, which hold on to carbon, which makes sure that carbon don't, doesn't emit um, to the atmosphere. And then you have water in snow, which is important as drinking water to millions of people on Earth. And not to forget, water in snow is also important for energy, for example, hydropower. These are just some examples. Uh, water in the soil and in the snow are also affecting weather, uh, tourism, um, politics. There's many, many examples, but the key is really that water has always been important it has been at the cradle of all the old civilizations. It's important today and it will remain important in the future. So it's worth studying it. Why are we now so in, interested in the land surface? Well, first of all, I should point out land surface water, that's water in the soil, vegetation and moisture uh, and, and in the snow. That is a really small volume fraction of the total amount of water, because everyone knows that most of the water is stored in oceans, seas, ice caps, glaciers. But the water in the land surface is so special because it varies a lot in space and in time, and it's, and it's in direct contact with humans, with us. So we are directly affected by it. So that's why it's worth studying it. We as scientists have two main tools to understand our Earth or the land surface in this particular case, and that are models and observations. And in the best case, we combine both and we make what we call a digital twin. So we mimic our Earth or we make an image of our land surface. That's what the main topic of my talk today will be. And that's where my expertise really ends, but that's not where the data flow should end. From here, we go into monitoring and forecasting. Um, you can match that with people's activities, um, economic benefits, costs, risk assessments. And so there's a whole next um, 
trajectory of data flow um, that really should be used uh, mainly in social sciences and economy. So again, my focus will be on making this image of the land surface to the best of our ability. And we'll start with one of our tools, the observations. Of course, uh, we could put a lot of probes in our land surface and pretend that we know how our land surface looks like, but that is not going to work if we work at a large scale. So if we work at a larger scale, we use um, satellite data most of the time. You see some examples here of different missions and they're colored by um, what, which variable they could potentially measure. And if they're dashed, that means um, that the sensor is not developed for, for example, soil moisture, but you could possibly use it to detect soil moisture. In any case, we do have an abundance of missions that allow us to measure water in the land surface. And the majority, almost all of these missions use electromagnetic radiation to see what's happening in the land surface. There's one notable exception, and that's the GLACE mission, which uses gravity, so the pull of the Earth on the satellite. How did we get there uh, to, to all these satellite missions? Well, it all started uh, in the late 19th century uh, with the development of Max Maxwell Peary, um, balloons, photography, and then we went into aircraft and radar with the World Wars, and then by 1957, um, 1957, we have the first satellite in space. From there onwards, it started growing and growing, and right now we have an exponential growth in satellite missions. At this time, we have 3,400 active satellites. That same amount, uh, again, is non-active, so there's more than 7,000 satellites in space. Of those 3,400, um, about 20% is used for Earth observation. Why do we need so many satellite um, missions? Well, we collect data at different spatial and temporal resolutions because our processes on Earth have all these different spatial scales and temporal scales. In addition, all these missions only measure a particular part of our Earth or a particular part of the land surface, for example, only temperature or only vegetation. So we need that combination of multiple sensors to get the complete picture. So again, for the land surface, uh, we resort to four main sources of Earth observation and um, gravity data, visible and infrared, and then passive and active microwave data. I will be focusing on microwave data because those data, they are directly telling us something about the amount of water in the soil or in the snow or in the vegetation. So microwave data, um, unlike what you might think of the name, these are long wavelengths, much longer than what you're used uh, to, the visible light, right? You're used to looking at pictures that um, tell us something about reflectance, visible light. Microwaves are much longer wavelengths and they carry much less energy. That's the reason why you need an antenna to collect microwaves on a satellite. So if you don't know anything about remote sensing, just remember that microwave data tell us something directly about water. They are able to give us information in the dark and through clouds. And the added advantage is that they penetrate a little bit into the soil, the snow, or the vegetation. So it's not just a superficial layer, it goes a little bit deeper. There's two types of microwave radiation that we can collect. Um, either we can collect data passively, then we measure radiances, or actively, and then we measure backscatters. So a passive sensor just hovers over the surface and receives natural emission from the soil. An active sensor sends radiation and waits for the return to understand how the surface has affected the return signal. In any case, that signal that the satellite sees is affected by soil moisture, vegetation, water, and temperature. And if there is snow and the wavelength is short enough, uh, then it's also snow is affecting um, the microwave radiation. So that's a quick introduction on the data that I'll be using in the examples that are to come. Our second tool was models, right? And the land modeling, that is composed of two parts. We have the prognostic land surface models, 
which basically are a compilation of decades of um, scientists that have gained insight in physical processes, and they have put that into um, models, computer models, that basically reflect conservation of mass and energy to its physical laws. And also the prognostic land surface model has memory, so it produces forecasts based on a previous state. The diagnostic part in our land modeling system is typically the conversion of those land surface variables to something that the satellite sees via radiative transfer. Um, for example, going from sun moisture to radiance or backscatter. So that's purely diagnostic, there's no memory of that system. My focus today will be on the left-hand side only, so on the land surface models. The land surface models um, that we typically use, they run offline, that means decoupled from the atmosphere, and this we give atmospheric input as an input to the simulations. For example, merit to reanalysis uh, meteorology. Then we give state of the art, uh, state of the art soil and vegetation parameters as an input to the land surface model. And the land surface model produces frequent, consistent, complete global sets of all the variables that you can imagine, um, both observed variables and unobserved variables. So you can go deep in the soil and still simulate things. The two models that uh, we frequently use are NOAA and P within NASA's land information system and catchment land surface model with, within NASA's just five land data simulation system. So two different land surface models, slightly different physics, um, but they're doing the same thing. Typically these models, uh, they represent nominal land surface, right? Um, either with snow cover or without snow cover. And very often we miss some processes, such as, for example, irrigation, even though there's quite some irrigated land on Earth. Another example that's not often missing is, um, for example, peatlands or other specific ecosystems um, that are not well represented in state-of-the-art land surface models. So now we have data, right? And we have models, so we could use um, data to improve here the input to our models or to improve the parameters or improve uh, the state. Uh, you can also think of it in the other way around. You can use models to add value to observations. And that's what I want to convey with this picture. Our satellite observations, they are typically very superficial, so only of a surface layer, and they have lots of gaps. Now we can use models to interpolate and extrapolate um, those data. And plus the added value is also both have errors, observations and models. And if we combine them, um, the error will be less. So that's what um, I'll show in the examples. We'll go from observed data to uh, updating of unobserved processes. We'll go from coarse satellite data to finer scale information. And we'll go from intermittent satellite data to complete pictures of our Earth. So let's start with coarse scale data assimilation. An example is coarse scale radiance data assimilation. So that's passive microwave, brightness temperatures, it's all the same thing, uh, from, for example, the SMOS or the SMAP mission. Two very similar missions. One is European, the other one is uh, from the NASA. And I'll tell you how we downscale that coarse data brightness temperature to update both the surface soil moisture and the root zone soil moisture and all other variables, such as, for example, runoff. So let's see how the model helps here in this process. We start bottom left with a fine scale simulation uh, with the land surface model of soil temperature, soil moisture, vegetation, and all the other variables. These variables are propagated through a radiative transfer model to produce estimates of brightness temperature. And then they are aggregated to the footprint of the satellite. That gives us something like the observations, but now produced by the model. So it gives us simulated brightness temperature. At the other hand, we receive SMOS observations from SMOS radiometer, also brightness temperatures. We compare the simulations against the observations. And from that difference, we uh, compute increments 
that allow us to update the fine scale model. So now that process, of course, it's not magic. That's what we do via, via a three-dimensional ensemble common filter. I won't go into details, so that's really mathematics, stochastic processes. Uh, but it's the difference between observations and forecasts that is used to update the fine scale model simulations. And so we start from satellite data, and this is the result, the data simulation results. So starting from 36 kilometer data, we go to nine kilometer estimates of, for example, surface root zone, root, surface root zone, uh, soil moisture, and soil temperature. You see, it's complete maps, there are no gaps. It's not only the surface, it's also the root zone and it's other variables. On top of that, we have uncertainty estimates, which fall out of the data simulation system. Also good to know is that we have this data every three hours, as opposed to the satellite data, which are only recurring every few days. So this is an actual operational product, this map level for a product, which is publicly available. Now that SMAP level 4 product does not only assimilate SMAP data, there's something else going on. There are also precipitation projections used, gauge-based precipitation observations are used to improve the simulation. So you have the land surface model that is adding value to the SMAP data, but there's also uh, precipitation corrections. Now we'll try to see how much each of both, uh, the precipitation correction and the SMAP data simulation actually contribute to the performance of the system. And for that, we run three additional cases, a control run without any precipitation corrections and without data simulation, a simulation with only precipitation correction and a simulation with only brightness temperature data simulation. On the right-hand side, you see the results in terms of soil moisture, so evaluation versus in situ data, the core site data of soil moisture for the surface soil moisture and the wood zone soil moisture. And on the y-axis, you see the performance. The higher the correlation are, the better, right? The first case here is a control run without any precipitation correction and without data assimilation. The second bar shows you that assimilating the coarse scale SMAP data helps us to improve the performance of surface soil moisture. But in that second block, you see that it also improves the, uh, improves the roots on soil moisture. So that's how it has a big contribution. The third bar shows you the improvement due to precipitation corrections that also improves versus the control run. And then the fourth bar shows you the combination. So both assimilating SMAP and correcting precipitation, and that gives you the best results. But you can see here on the right-hand side that the main improvement in terms of soil moisture comes from SMAP data assimilation. The left-hand side, uh, goes one step further and it shows how subsequently the runoff is improved. At all these dots here we have measurements of runoff and uh, we see that most of them show an improvement in skill so the correlation improves becomes blue um, and that's for the total this is some of the SMAP brightness temperature simulation and the precipitation correction. But now if you look at the numbers, the impact of brightness temperature assimilation is only 0.03, whereas the impact of precipitation corrections is much higher, it's 0.17. So in terms of runoff, it's actually the precipitation that contributes most to the results. So what I want to make clear, clear is that it's not only the data assimilation, it's also just improving your model input in this particular case that's helping the results. So this is starting from an operational product. Now let's go to two applications that further elaborate on this project. The first one is something similar to the SNAP level four system, but now we further adjust the model for peatland processes. So there's a peatland module added into the model, and then we do small brightness temperature simulation. The nice thing is that now we can evaluate the groundwater table, because in peatlands, the soil moisture and groundwater that's tightly connected to each other. So instead of evaluating in terms of soil moisture, we evaluate the groundwater. And what you see now is if we change our model from the regular catchment model to the peat version of the catchment model, our errors decrease, that's the first thing, and the correlation increase. 
And even on top of that, we do data simulation. That's the second bar. We get a further improvement. Well, yeah, actually, a slight degradation for um, the original model. It's slight, it's similar for PCLSM, but in terms of correlation, we get a further improvement due to data simulation. So again, the same message here. It's both the data assimilation and improvements in the model that yield us the best results. Final application of coarse scale data assimilation is uh, landslides, where we checked out uh, if data assimilation products help us to predict landslides. So before I go there, let's see how much of the satellite data actually see landslides happening, soil moisture products, I mean, at this point, because soil moisture is directly affecting landslides, right? So on the figure in the left, you see uh, how many of the landslides are covered by SMOS observations, SMOS retrievals with different quality flags, SMOS brightness, temperature, and grace data. On the right-hand part, you see uh, that for SMAP data, but that's a different period, so that's why the scale is different. The colored part of the bar is how many of the data are available at the day of the landslide. If you add the white part, that's how many uh, how many landslides are covered by satellite data within a week. Yeah. So for most of the sensors or most of the microwave data, we don't even cover half of the landslide data. So that's why we need data assimilation. We need a model to interpolate that data and make sense of um, what the current sun moisture status is. Now, does that help the data simulation? Well, for that, let's look at the right-hand side. Uh, so the red line is the model-only simulation, an open loop, and all the other um, lines are data simulation runs. And you see that, uh, for example, for SMOS data simulation, that's a dash green and blue line. Uh, the green one also has gray data simulation. Um, you see that SOMARSH is pulled up by the observations. And consequently, in the second plot, also root zone soil moisture is pulled up. And that's good because initially that model was far too dry at the time when the landslide was happening on the 29th of January 2016 in Colombia. So here we have a nice example where data simulation is helping us to improve the estimation of landslides. Now a little note here is not always happening and it's not always helping because if the model already simulated really wet conditions, then data simulation can actually deteriorate uh, the results a little bit. So these are two examples uh, of grid scale data simulation. Now um, we also have fine scale data. So why not try to assimilate those? That brings me to Sentinel-1. That's an active microwave sensor. So it gives us backscatters. And here I'm showing you work in progress. So again, we have a land surface model and now we are simulating backscatter data, but we also activate an irrigation model. So we further again improve our model. And then we do the data simulation with that system. So the backscatter data simulation will help us again to improve soil moisture, also vegetation in this case, and it will improve our irrigation simulation. And that's what you see in the top figure, that's soil moisture. The blue line is the open loop, the red line is the data simulation. In the data simulation dynamics really change, not only because we update soil moisture, but also because we update the timing of the irrigation and the amount of the irrigation. And that's what you see in the bottom plot. So blue is again what the open loop simulated for irrigation, and red is what the data simulation simulates in terms of irrigation. And the red is closer to the in-situ data, which are in green. Now, this is a tricky part because modeling irrigation is hard, even though uh, you might think you do it perfect, humans always do it differently. So then uh, your model results still don't perform well. So that's challenging research. More fine scale data assimilation, again from Sentinel-1, but now we don't assimilate the backscatter data. Instead, we simulate snow depth retrievals. So we first convert backscatter to snow depth, and then we ingest it in the model. Same story, we use snow MP, we do snow depth assimilation, and in this particular case, we add a river routing system. <clears throat> to the land surface model. We evaluate the results in terms of in-situ data. We have a whole bunch of snow depth stations, but also runoff stations. Maybe a little bit of an explanation of that snow depth data. Um, that's a product developed by Hans Stevens and my team. 
It's a one kilometer product and you should only use it for dry snow because when the snow becomes wet, that's what you see here, right? The third figure um, in March. So as the cold snow or the cold temperatures um, warm up, you get wet snow. At that time, the radar signal is absorbed by the snow and then the retrievals are in weight. So we're only going to assimilate the dry snow data and we assign them an error of 17 centimeters. Okay, so again, a land surface model and river writing to go from snow depth ultimately to runoff. This is the idea again. So on the left panel, you see Sentinel-1 retrievals. On the right hand, you see uh, the open loop and model only simulation. And you already see that the Sentinel data has much finer granularity. It has much more variability. On this specific, specific day, it also has a higher or in this specific winter, it also has a higher amount of snow. By combining the two, you get the bottom image of our earth, right, our data simulation results. And for all these red dots, we now evaluate if the estimated snow depth is better or worse in the data simulation product than in the open loop. And that's what you see on the right hand side. In terms of correlation, we only have a little bit of a gain, a little bit of an improvement. But in terms of bias and mean absolute error, we really reduce our bias. And that is great because snow is a cumulative variable. Uh, so unlike other um, time series where we really want the random error to decrease, uh, it's fine for snow that the bias is decreased. That, that's great. I should also mention that most of the improvements is for sites that are above 2,000 meter elevation. Because of course, the more we go to the valley, the more we have wet snow and um, less accurate data from Sentinel-1. So this is in terms of snow depth. From snow depth, the model allows to estimate snow water equivalent, so the amount of water in the snow. And then by routing it through the rivers, we get estimates of runoff. And here you see three um, sites where we have runoff data, one in Italy, one in France, and on the right-hand side in Switzerland. The black data are the in-situ data. The red dots are the open loops, so the model only. And then the blue ones are the data assimilation results. And you can see how assimilating Sentinel-1 snow depth retrievals ultimately really helps to get the runoff much improved, both in total amounts of discharge and in the timing of the peak. And it's often the case, again, it's not always the case. And most of the time, the improvements are again found in uh, at stations where the main mean basin elevation is above, above 1,000 meters. OK, so I hope I've shown you that models are able to add value to our satellite data. They interpolate the data, they extrapolate them to unobserved variables, they downscale the data, and they then give us consistent, fairly consistent water budgets, complete images um, of the Earth, um, such as, for example, here that example of roots and soil moisture based on brightness temperature estimates. However, there are a few notes to make here, and I'm just picking out uh, two examples here. Most of the models assume steady state. They work with some constant land cover, so they discard the fact that, for example, a forest may be cut. Um, irrigation is really hard to simulate. Groundwater pumping is often discarded. And if we then do irrigation, um, it's very hard to locate where the water is withdrawn from. So just to illustrate the problem, in the bottom here, you see two simulations, one with a climatological leaf area index as the top figure. And the blue one is with the interannually varying vegetation um, data set. At a specific time here, uh, I think in 2004, uh, there was deforestation going on in this plot. This is a plot in uh, the Trincheco in Argentina. And you see that the LAI, well, it changes a little bit, um, but not drastically. But um, in the model simulations, you see that replacing a forest with a cropland really changes the climatology of the soil moisture. That is the total roots and soil moisture. So after 2014, we get cropland 
and the model simulations, the sun moisture really becomes wetter. That is something that we often don't account for, just as an example. But in any case, we have really nice results from the data simulation. We get those images. And from there, um, we really need to go to a sustainable water management. And that requires interdisciplinary action uh, to see where it's worthy to install irrigation systems or where we need to send food aid. Or in terms of salt, uh, snow, for example, how do we manage um, our reservoirs? When do we let water go? How much do we actually store? So to conclude, I hope I convinced you that we have currently a large and an increasing amount of bird observations. Um, in most of my examples, I showed how we directly assimilate the signal, um, the, so the microwave signal, but there was also this example of snow depth assimilation where we actually assimilated the retrieval. So that's a whole different talk. How do we actually, which type of bird observation do we use, the direct signals or the retrievals? But the key of this talk today was that both data assimilation and model improvements, both are needed to get the best picture of our Earth. And I've shown that in two types of applications, grid scale data assimilation using SMOS and SMAP microwave data to estimates from the microwave signal, soil moisture or groundwater in peatlands and ultimately runoff. And that's important, for example, groundwater in peatlands um, to then simulate what the carbon releases to the atmosphere and what the impact would be of wildfires. The other example that I've shown is uh, how those soil moisture estimates can help landslide estimation. Then I've shown you finer scale Sentinel-1 data assimilation to update soil moisture, leaf area index, and irrigation in an agricultural setting. Work in progress, very challenging or assimilating Sentinel-1 snow depths to estimate snow water amounts and ultimately runoff. So that's important for hydropower and tourism, of course. All these examples were in an offline system. And in the future, I think we need to go to a full atmosphere land coupled system. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabriel, for your presentation. So the floor is open for questions. As I uh, told you before, you can stay anonymous, put your question in the chat, or you could simply raise your hand. And then uh, I can see already a couple of questions. Maybe we start with Alicia Mizabe. Thank you very much, Gabriella, for a very interesting and very informative presentation. And now I understand that a lot of uh, sources for measuring water quantity. In our work, we encounter many times that water quality also matters a lot for agricultural productivity, for ecosystem health. I was wondering if you have any recommendations for remote sensing applications for water quality, and how do you also evaluate the perspectives uh, for the development of remote sensing measurements of water quality? Thank you. Really good question. <clears throat> so water quality is not my actual field of expertise, but I can tell you that water quality can, can be measured with optical data. So it's really the spectral information um, that can tell you something about what is in the water. Um, and yeah, that could be any component, any chemical component that's actually affecting optical radiation. So for example, I would recommend Sentinel-2 in that case. Um, Quality could be anything from chemical components all the way to salinity, just natural salinity as well, of course. I hope that that helps. I would move to the next question by Iman Sajid. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, thank you so much for a nice presentation. It was really comprehensive. Uh, just, I want to ask you that uh, you showed from uh, your slide number 18 about soil moisture, uh, root zone soil moisture, I think. And also I was worried that uh, you were showing the units by volumetric water content. And I was a bit curious that the depth of soil moisture is considered around one meter, or is it possible to go beyond one meter or not? 
to uh, simulate this uh, soil moisture content and further depths. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very good observation. We assume one meter, but it's possible to have a different layering system in the model if you would want to. Yeah, yeah but uh, it's not uh, dependent on soil texture and other properties of soil. This radar waves it just detect uh, how it detect the content of soil in the root zone. So it, it, it was just observed by microwave lens, right? Yes. So um, the microwave data only see the surface layer. And then from there, the model propagates it to deeper layers. But we give soil texture information to the model. So um, these volumetric data, they use porosity information of uh, all the different soils. Uh, so we give the soil texture to the model, right? Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And next question by Ariana. I, I have an idea what your question will be. <laughs> yes, uh, it's about irrigation. So um, I was wondering if you plan to test a different uh, type or simulate a different type of irrigations. And uh, if you have some ideas, maybe how to maybe detect them from satellite. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, good question. Um, so for now, we have assumed sprinkler irrigation um, because we are trying to figure out a data simulation system. But you're very right that very different types of irrigation could completely change the results. We haven't done it yet. Uh, it's on our list to do. Now, how could we detect the different types of irrigation? I think for that, you need optical remote sensing. Uh, rather than microwave remote sensing. So the optical remote sensing may tell you patterns and from there you can derive the type of irrigation. Uh, so one follow-up question, uh, but how do you uh, represent the sprinkler in ONP if you do not have a coupled system? I mean, uh, uh, there are um, some schemes already and it shows that there is a difference if you have the evaporator evaporation or the microphysics processes included? Yeah, excellent question again. So uh, we mimic precipitation. So we compute the amount of irrigation needed and then we add it simply to the precipitation. So we don't have a fully coupled system but we add it only to the precipitation. Yeah. Indeed, in a fully coupled system, everything would be better but also more complex. So. Question addressed, Mariana? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have more questions, but maybe another time. Thanks. Okay. I think the next question by Joachim van Baum. Thank you for your talk. Very interesting. Um, in view of um, uh, the debates over carbon sequestration, um, um, I ask how far have we come, how, has, how far has your community come to capture change in soil carbon? Good question, and I, I owe you the answer because I don't know exactly to which level I can answer this one. So capturing soil carbon, um, I only know that from peatlands research. So if we drain peatlands, um, carbon is going to be released if we just we wet uh, we're capturing more carbon. But to put some amounts on it, I wouldn't be able to do that accurately. Thank you. Ariana, second question. I can see your hand is still on. No, sorry, sorry. Maybe I can ask a question. Um, one question regarding the satellite systems. You showed, you know, we have these many satellite systems, active sensors, passive sensor. I wonder about these opportunity satellite uh, sensors, opportunity fleets of satellites that we now start to see with commercial companies like the, you know, like what SpaceX uh, sends to space. 
or the Spire company or Planet Labs and, and all these satellites. So maybe the accuracy is not that high, but there are so, so many of them. So is that something that one will be also able to use? I'm sure we would be able to use it. Um, I think the limitation there is the, the period over which you collect the data, because they're typically shorter lived than the traditional satellite missions. So to then have a long enough time record to, for example, compute climatologies and then do the proper rescaling or bias correction for a data assimilation system, that is much more challenging. Um, but why not take up the challenge, right, and try it out? Um, so it's possible, but it's um, not as trivial as if you have a long time series of consistent data. That's my take on that. Jan, your question. Uh, hi, Gabriel. Um, thanks uh, for the presentation. I have, um, while you were talking, I was wondering why economists are not using data assimilation um, to improve their models and the forecasts of their models. As you know, we are pretty bad at forecasts. Um, and uh, I did a quick Google and I actually didn't find much. Are you aware of of um, these techniques being used in other disciplines or have you collaborated in, in, in teams where, where that was being tried? Yeah, excellent question. So data assimilation is widely used. Um, it started historically, historically um, with making sure that rockets orbits or rockets paths uh, were adjusted. So it's used in physics, it's used in atmospheric sciences, in oceanography, whatever, however you call it. Um, it's used in any robotic system. If you if you're riding a motor, the motor will use data assimilation to put you in equilibrium. Um, many industrial pro, uh, processes actually also use data assimilation, so they collect data on the go and then they adjust their trajectories. And I'm sure that in economy they must be using it at some point as well. If you have stochastic pro processes, then probably use it. I haven't collaborated with uh, people in the economy, but um, I cannot imagine that they haven't used it. Maybe we just call it differently. Could be. Um, sometimes they call it history matching, uh, if you go into more calibration part, um, Bayesian merging. Yeah. Other questions from the audience? Maybe coming back to Jan's question, maybe this is a question for the two of you, Jan and Gabriel. Uh, from my limited knowledge, if you want to have your model, if you want to improve your model with respect to forecasting something, you can improve the model state itself, or you can try to improve parameters in the model and maybe first a question to Gabriel, what's more important? And maybe then afterwards question to Jan, since I do not know anything about economic models, whether it's more important to know the state, the, the current state of the model, or whether it's more important to know the parameters of the model. Yeah, that's a tricky question. Um, it depends on what you're after. So if you're are after getting interannual variability and short-term variability correct, then I would say um, go with state updating. But if you're if you want to get the absolute values, the long-term absolute values of, for example, soil moisture or any other variable correct, then you need to go with parameter estimation. So if you're more interested in relative variability, then state updating is the better idea to get your forecast launched properly. Um, but parameter updating gives you the better absolute values. That is my take on this. I don't know, Jan, if you want to add anything. Yeah, I, I, think, I think basically there is also a, a language challenge here. Um, and, and maybe what, what, what we are doing is very similar. Um, we just really call it differently. So. The thing that comes closest to what I've understood um, is data assimilation. What I have been involved in is um, we had like a, a numerical model that was predicting uh, tree grass equilibria in savannas. 
um, and we had observations about um, different states of savannas. Um, and then um, that data was used to basically fit the model um, uh, and, and parameterize the model. Um, and then it would, you know, predict, um, uh, and then you could use it for predictions. And I assume that is kind of, of what data assimilation is about. So it was in order to estimate the parameters um, of the model um, without actually being able to prove whether the relationships that were modeled are, are causally correct, because um, uh, that is a different story, um, the, the, the causal relationship. So by specifying the model in that way, we assume that these causal, causal relationships hold. But after doing that, of course, the model could predict um, uh, things like uh, uh, fire occurrence or fire intensity, and it could predict um, uh, the state of, of root and shoot biomass and things like that. Um, and uh, uh, so it could do much more than you could have just done with the data. So I assume that's the same thing, but that's only one of the things that is being done in economics. Often it's about um, actually trying to figure out what is the causal relationship between two variables. Um, and then perhaps um, it's not the right tool to use. But um, I think this is to be discussed in the future when we uh, get the positive response from the DFG. Which you are expecting. Yeah, I can also see that what you're explaining, Jan, that requires an historical amount of data, whereas the filtering that I tried to discuss in this particular talk it was all filtering. Um, you can just run the model, model up to right now, and if a satellite flies over right now, you update your entire state consistently. Um, that's different from fitting the model with past observations. Um, also, is of course, um, if you couple that land system to the atmosphere, and a minor change or a minor update in the state um, will then actually improve all your atmospheric simulations as well. That's the idea. Whereas, so normally a system is built so that um, it's using a consistent, well, it's a, using a fixed set of parameters in the land surface. And the atmosphere responds to that land surface, however it is parameterized. And then it's only deviations, like relative changes in the land surface that are important for weather forecasting, for example. So it really depends on the application. Gabriel, you mentioned coupling the model, and it was also on your last slide. It seems to me like the holy grail. So what will be required to uh, implement the data assimilation in a coupled in a coupled model when you when you plan or then do you plan to do this in the in the future i i definitely have been thinking a lot about it. <laughs> different ways of coupling right you have weak coupling and you have strong coupling and the question is um what do you put in that state vector is that state is a, if you have a fully coupled system um do you use all the atmospheric layers temperature and moisture and the soil moisture and the snow and all that in one big state vector and you assimilate land surface data and atmospheric data that entire system that's going to be intense right or do you only update your land surface and then let that update propagate to the atmosphere, which would be a weakly coupled system because you send information from the surface to the atmosphere. So if I would start that um, whole process, I would start with the latter, just out of practical considerations, because updating the entire system at once uh, is just complex and I'm not an atmospheric expert. So we should start where we have the knowledge and then propagate from there. But ultimately it would be nice to have the entire system, the entire state variables, set of state variables updated. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking uh, around. Are there other questions from the audience? No, it doesn't seem the case. Then let me thank you again on behalf of the TIA6 for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for being here.